If you have your Bible, open your Bible before we go to the, to the page. Revelation chapter 5. Revelation chapter 5. We understand that the four horsemen of Apocalypse, they are the result of the opening of seals. Of seals. Regard the seals as, as books. Books. One book, as a matter of fact. One book with seven pages. And each page, each page is sealed and cannot be opened. But each page represents a judgment of God upon the earth. That's what the seals are. So every time one seal is open, one page of God's judgment is written and happens. So let us see to the Bible who opens, in the Bible who opens this seal. Revelation chapter 5 verse 1 says, And I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne, who is that one? God the Father. A scroll written inside and on the back, sealed with seven seals. Then I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy? To open the scroll and to lose its seals. And no one in heaven or on the earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look at it. So I wept much because no one was found worthy to open and read the scroll or to look at it. But one of the elders said to me, do not weep. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed to open the scroll and to lose its seven seals. So you see, Jesus died on the cross to save us, to take away our, our pain, our infirmity, our sorrows, our sins. But also, he prevailed against death, so one day he could open the seal so the judgments of God would be poured out upon the earth and I looked and behold in the midst of the throne and of the four living creatures and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb do not think about an animal a lamb as though it had been slain who is this one here now who is this one? Jesus. Lamb means a sacrificial lamb given for the, for the sin offering, to forgive sins. So that's how Jesus was seen, was, was seen by John. It's a lamb, one who gave his life to take our sins upon himself so we could be free from them. A lamb. As if it had been, as though it had been slain. Having seven horns. And seven eyes. Seven horns and seven eyes. The number seven means totality. Accomplishment. That's it. Seven. Horn means authority. So it means this lamb who is also the lion of Judah. He had authority over everything. And the Bible says he had seven eyes, which means he can see all things everywhere. So he could see and he had authority over all. And continue saying, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. The seven manifestations we spoke about before represented by the seven um, uh, the seven uh, lights stained or lamps stained in the candelabra, in the menorah. The spirit of the Lord, wisdom, understanding, counsel, might. Seven. Seven. He can detect. He can see. No matter who sees. Perhaps you do an act of kindness. Nobody sees. But I tell you one thing. God what? Sees. You do an act of obedience when nobody is watching. God is watching. 
you do something bad, nobody is watching. But God is also what? Watching. So he had eyes to see everyone and everything. And authority over everyone and thing. And the Bible says, finalizing this text, verse 7 says, Then he came and took the scroll out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. So Jesus, the Lion of Judah, the Lamb who had been slain to take away our sins upon himself. Died so you today could live. Jesus is the one who opened the seals. And the first four seals is the judgment of God upon men. Which brings about the four horsemen. The first one was the horsemen of deceit. The second one was the horsemen of war. The red horse, the horsemen of war. The third horseman was the horseman of famine. And the fourth horseman, we're going to understand here now. Let us go to the page. The fourth horseman. When he opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the four living creature or the fourth living creature say, Come. So I looked, and there was a pale horse. And the name of him who sat on it was death. And Hage followed him. Hage is another name for hell. Power over the fourth of the earth was given to them. Not only to him, but to them. To both death and hell. To kill with the sword. The second horseman he bore... A big sword. And that sword was to kill, to cause war. But you see here now, this, this fourth horseman, he was also given the power to kill with what? The sword to intensify war. And also with what? Hunger. Just like the third horseman, he was given the power to intensify the current suffering of the people in those days. With death. And by the beasts of the earth. Quoting Revelation 6 verses 7 and 8. In the original Greek. The color of this horse. Is actually a yellowish green. Like that of a corpus. It's no accident. That this rider's name is death. He comes to collect the souls. That were killed by the previous riders. And with power to intensify the catastrophes left by wars and famine, the rider of the pale horse will bring death, sicknesses that will spread without control and will affect millions around the world. In today's number, a fourth of the earth is roughly 1.9 billion people. I want you to watch this, this page here. Let us go to this web page here. It's called the World Meter. The World Meter. Do you know how many people are alive today? Look at this page there now. The World Meter. Current population: eight billion, sixty-seven million, three hundred and twenty-five thousand eight hundred and growing. As the population today. Numbers of death. Where is the number of death? Death today, right? Death to, is that today? Yes. 132,000. And you see there, each number that goes up there is a life that got lost. Perhaps a soul that was taken to hell. Now understand when the when when the, the study here says. This, um, uh, this fourth horseman, he will come after, he will come after the rapture. So the world will not have, or perhaps will have a billion then or, or more. I, I don't know when he's come, the Lord Jesus is coming back. But the, the saved will no longer be there. They've been raptured. And we're going to talk about that later, another later date. When is this? 
will be raptured, they will no longer be here. Those who are faithful to God, those who overcame their flesh, those who did what Paul said, Paul said he crucified his flesh every day, which means he denied his will. How often? Every day. Because your will is to sin every day. Your will is to displease God on daily basis. My will is to follow my flesh on daily basis. And if I do not sacrifice my will, I cannot be saved. Jesus himself, he said, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself. You are not your best friend. For you to be saved, you have to make war against your own flesh. Against your own self, against your own desires. Pick up his cross and what? Follow me. Follow him in his footsteps. To be a Christian is to walk in the footsteps of Jesus. At the end of his life, on the physical life, on the cross, Jesus said, Father, forgive them. He was nailed to a cross. Can you imagine the pain he felt? He had been beaten with a whip. His flesh was not recognizable anymore. The Bible says Isaiah prophesied about that day. He said there was no beauty in him. There was no likeness of man in him. He was beaten. He was, he was disfigured. With a, with, a, with a crown of thorns into his head. Naked on a cross. Yet he said, Father, forgive them. They do not know what they are doing. Why should you keep a grudge? Pastor, I was violated. I was abandoned. Betrayed, cheated upon. I deserve to feel this way. But if you are a Christian, a follower of Christ, even if you are nailed to a cross, disfigured by the beating you got, with a, with a tawny crown carved into your head, you still have to say, Father, forgive them. That is, if God indeed is your father that's what defines God as our father is when we are suffering like that in the yet we are willing to forgive so deny yourself pick up your cross and what follow him look at how many people die or died or are dying today 130 plus thousand and the population only increasing. Only increasing. So now imagine this horseman was given authority to kill one fourth, one fourth of the earth. Let's continue now. When the Lord Jesus spoke of the end times, he alluded to epidemics that would affect humanity during the Great Tribulation. Here we are quoting Luke 21, but I would like you to go to, to Matthew chapter 24. Take your Bible now, Matthew 24. Because I, when I read both of them, I see Matthew 24 as a more complete, it's more complete when it talks about Revelation is more complete. So Matthew 24. If you're not going to look, you can go there after in your house. But Matthew 24 is much more complete when it talks about the great tribulation. Matthew 24 verse 3, the Bible says, Now, as he sat on the Mount of Olives, his disciples came to him privately, saying, Elish, we knew these things be. And what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of age? And Jesus answered and said to them, Take heed 
that no one deceives you. Look at the connection between Matthew here, the words of Jesus here now, and the happening of the four horsemen. The first horseman was riding a white horse. He had a bow, but no arrows. And he made war. But his war was not war with weapons. He had a bow, but no arrows. It was a war of what? Ideas. Of information. He was a deceiver. And here the Lord Jesus talking about the end. He says, let no one deceive you. You have to pay attention so no one may deceive you. Because today, today, today currently, we are living in days of war of information. Or misinformation or disinformation. Manipulation. All trying to manipulate your love and your hate. Or hatred. So here the Lord Jesus says, take heed that no one what deceives you. The first horseman was bringing deceit, but that's the world today. The world is living in times of misinformation. I said before, there are, there are programs out there that can manipulate your voice, your face. Can make, can make a film of you doing something that you have not done. That's what they call deep fakes. Nearly impossible to distinguish truth from lies nowadays. Nearly impossible for you to distinguish what is true and what is lie. But the Bible says pay attention that no one deceives you. So take heed, pay attention. Let no one what? Deceive you. Let no one deceive you. All the means for this horseman, the white, the one riding a white horse, all the means for this white, um, the, white the, the ride of the white horse manifest himself is available. All the means is available. It's all there. Once again, there is a deep connection between what the Lord Jesus is talking about here and what Revelation says will happen in the coming of the four horsemen. So take heed, let no one deceive you. For many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ and will deceive many. So understand this, the deceit of the devil here it's not against those who are his. The devil here is planning to deceive those who are gods. Those who are Christ. The devil does not have a sight on those who are his. They are his. They are heading on to hell. So the devil doesn't worry about them. They are part of his team. The devil's concern is you. Who are resisting. Do you understand? The world wants you to go in this direction and you say, take me, take me there. Don't take me. Try. try. <laughs> Don't, but try. huh? <laughs> Those who are resisting, that's, that's what the deceit will be for. Those who are resisting to embrace and say, let us go together. Are you understanding? You are there resisting the devil. The devil wants to deceive you. For you to embrace him together and sing that song. The deceit is not against those who are already deceived. It's against you who are resisting. Be careful. How will the devil try to deceive you? By offering you exactly what you think is good for you. Not what God says is good for you. For instance, the Bible says, the, Jesus said, in the world you will have tribulation. Right? In the world, you'll have what? Tribulation. We fight our very best to avoid what? <laughs> yes or no? You do your very best to avoid having problems. That's our lives. We do our very best to have a stable life. But Jesus said, in the world, you will have tribulation. So in times of tribulation, the devil will offer not victory, but to ease the tribulation. How do I ease the tribulation? By giving into his will. 
When you are a true Christian and you say no to the world, you will put yourself into tribulation because people will criticize you, people will diminish you because you chose to do the will of God and not your own will. So they will call you names. How to ease this tribulation? Do exactly what everybody does. And that's what the devil will try to deceive you. And then he uses terminology in the Christian faith such as, once you are saved, you are saved forever. You don't have to bother anymore. You got baptized, you are saved, live your life anyhow, you are saved. Theologies, just like the Nicolaitans, the sin of your flesh does not affect your spirit. You can be a spiritual person, but you can live in sin. But what matters is you forgive those who sin against you. You can commit adultery, but love your neighbor as you love yourself. Mm, sounds good. Sounds what? Good. Appealing to those who are called Christians, but they have such a, the world has such a pull to them, has such an appeal to them. It sounds good to them. So they will embrace the world, will stop criticism, tribulation at the cost of their soul. In the world, you will have what? Tribulation. But he spoke to his apostles. To those who are very close to him. Those who are very close to him. Jesus said, in the world you'll have tribulation. So if you're close to Jesus, expect that you be what? Expect that you be what? Tribulation. Unavoidable. Qualifies you as a Christian. Paul went as far as saying, do not glory in this, but glory in what? In your tribulations. Glory in the persecutions because of your faith. So this deceit is to offer you something God has not offered. But will sound good to your flesh. Will sound good to your five senses. Will sound very good to your five senses. And that's where many who were close to God will embrace the devil and go to hell. Maybe not on the highway, but on a small street. They were trailing the difficult way in a diversion from there that will take them to hell. Do not be deceived. The way is paved for these horsemen to deceive the Christians. And you will hear of wars, rumors of war. See that you are not troubled for all these things must come to pass. But the end is not yet. The rider of the red horse. Wars. Once again, strong connection. Strong connection here. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. And there will be what? Famine. The third horse man. Again, a strong what? Connection. In pestilences, in earthquakes in various places. Just before the war broke in Israel, or during the war in Israel, in Hamas, during the massacre in Israel, in the attack against Hamas, there were earthquakes in Afghanistan, killing thousands of people. It goes unnoticed, right? Nobody's talking about it. Thousands of people died. Earthquakes in various and these are the beginning of the beginning of sorrows once again a strong connection to what we are reading here now Luke 21 10 11 page now let us go to the page now and he said to them Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. Great earthquakes will occur in various places. And there will be famine and pestilences. And there will be terror and great signs from, from heaven. The situation will be so grave that starving and diseased animals will attack people and kill them. Some interpret the beasts of the earth in between quotes that unite with the rider as cruel, violent, savage men, devoid of human decency, 
who will attack the defenseless out of pure spite, taking any possession or food to ensure their own survival. Human life will no longer hold any, any value. Will hold no value whatsoever. That's what some interpret. But I, I do believe, like in the days of Noah, when the animals came into the ark, because God was restoring a covenant with mankind through Noah, I believe these animals now will follow this rider to kill. I don't think it's men. I think it's beasts. Beasts, wild beasts that will follow him to kill what is left. Once again, the world now is godless. Let us continue now. Note the natural sequence of judgments that come from the opening of the seals. The calamity of war will cause food to become scarce and cause famine. Famine will drastically reduce the quality, the quality of qu and quantity of available food for people and animals. Weakened people will easily contract diseases, which will quickly turn into epidemics, with no money to eat or buy medications, and with hospitals overflowing, the result will be the death of millions upon millions. But the rider death will not be alone. Hate or hell will come with him. Death will take the bodies of the people or of people. And hate right afterward will take their souls. At death, a soul is immediately taken to its destination. Either to hate hell or the bosom of Abraham. Paradise. After death. There is no repentance and no chance to choose a different destination for your soul. Note that the revelation brought by the fourth seal is that the vast majority of those affected by the four riders will not, or if not all, will go to hate or hell. When those people think that death has ended, their torment here on earth, it will only be the beginning. Many people think if I die, if I kill myself, my suffering will be over. Many, many young people, elderly people too, they think if I die, I am better than alive. My suffering will be over. No. Especially if you die by your own hand. You committed a sin which is murder. And because you died, you have no time to repent. And if you do not repent from your sins, what will happen to your soul? Hell. Eternal damnation. So if you think your, your suffering is over, when you die by your own hand, I tell you, the suffering you suffered here is not, not 0.00001% of the suffering coming. Whatever suffering we have here on earth, we can always turn to God and seek for help. However sad we may be, we can always seek for God's presence. And he is joy. He is joy. It's not he has joy. He is joy. And when you seek for him, joy will come upon you. Even in the worst moments of your life, you can still have joy if God is with you because you are with him. Now, you killed yourself. There's no hope of joy or salvation. It doesn't matter what anyone tells you. You sinned without time to repent. The soul, your eternal existence, lost. For as long as you live, there is hope. The words of David, when his baby boy died from, from Bathsheba. They came to him, his his the people close to him came to him and said, what is this? When he was alive and sick, you were, you were not eating, you were not anointing yourself, you were crying, mourning for him. And now you eat, drink, and anoint yourself. He said, when he was alive, there was hope. Now that he's dead, there is no hope. I will go to him, but he will not come to me. So for as long as you are alive, there is what? Hope. 
If you have suicidal thoughts, consider this. For as long as you are alive, there is hope after death. You have no hope whatsoever. So live. Fight against your problems. Hold on to God. He's there to help you. I want you to fully understand that this is not God's will. Hell was not made for human beings, but for the devil who pulls those who do his will down with him. This is why God left this warning in scripture so that people could repent and avoid this terrible suffering both here on earth and in eternity. Ezekiel said on chapter 18, verse 23, quoting God's thoughts, Do I have pleasure in the death of the wicked, says the Lord God, but rather that he should turn from his ways and live. Turn from your evil ways. That is life for you. Turn from your sins. That is life for you. Turn from your hatred. That is life for you. Turn away, but turn to God. What will be the final destination of your soul when it is separated from your body? I can't answer that for you. I can answer that for me. What guarantees my salvation? It's not a title of pastor. It's not the length of time I have been a Christian. It's not what I have done in the past. It's who I am before God today. As I said in the beginning of the service, the most important day of your life is not the first. It is the last. So make sure when you face your last day, your soul has a go bag with forgiveness, with joy, with peace, with a clear conscience.